The message today is uh, actually, I want to teach a little bit today, and um, I don't know where this will take us, and I don't know how much time I have, but I will try to try uh, and bring it together as clearly as possible, as simple as possible, so that we can all follow. What is on my mind today is Christian and politics. Christians and politics. What does politic, politics have to do in the life of a Christian? How should a Christian look at politics? How should we, as Christians, look at our government? Uh, like I said before, uh, they're facing problems in Nigeria. How does a Christian in that particular country deal with what is going on? And here in the United States, if you have not voted already, I voted last week. If you have not voted already, you're thinking about voting on the 3rd. And you are expected to vote on the 3rd. If you're a Christian, we're going to go through some scripture passages that will encourage you and let you know that it is important. It is important for a Christian to be involved in governing, in, in the way our government works, uh, how we relate to the government. So politics is a very strange thing. Politics is a very strange thing, and it is sometimes very dangerous in the church. Uh, I'm glad that we live in a country where there is separation between church and state. The state cannot tell us how to worship God, when to worship God, and where to worship God. At the same time, we as a church have to understand that we are separate from the government. Even though we should have a say so, in the government, in how the government runs, how our government operates, but we should not by any way at all define any government as being religious or as being righteous or as being uh, on the side of God. And this is really important. Whether you are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat, that is in the United States of America, or you are independent. It doesn't matter. Uh, we are in a constitutional republic. We are in a constitutional republic. There is nothing Christian about the government system in America. Absolutely nothing. Because the only government that God established is theocracy, where God rules, and that was rejected by Israelites a long time ago, and God has left us to do whatever we want to do. Uh, God gave us a government that he is in charge, he is in control, he tells how it is to be run, but we said, no, we want a king. We want a king over us to rule us just like the other nations, and so God has left us. So. Uh, in Russia, they have a totally different government. It's not as United States government because it is corrupt. It, it is uh, very, very centered on uh, the ruling class. Uh, in North Korea, you know, they have a dictator over there. Uh, in China, it's totally different. It's not a place where I would want to live. Uh, but they have their own system. In Nigeria, they have democracy. They have their own system as a constitutional republic also. In, in America, we have a system that we have. There is no system in the world. There is no system in the world that is a biblical system. If anybody tells you that this system is biblical, they are telling you nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. We have our own government. God, however, instructs us as citizens 
how we are to guide ourselves, how we are to guard ourselves, how we are to conduct ourselves when we are in a country like the United States or a country like Nigeria or the United Kingdom or like Canada. I spent four years in Canada and they have their own system too. It is not the same system as American system, but they have a system. Their system is not Christian either, but they have a very good parliamentary system over there, very similar to what is in Britain, in the United Kingdom. So my concern today, though, is to make a point that no government is perfect. Why is it not perfect? Because it is man-made. There's no government in the world that is perfect. They're all man-made. Government, uh, uh, they have rejected the way God wants to rule, what, the way God wants to uh, lead us, and therefore they form their own. Um, so, but the Bible encourages us as Christians to be engaged in our government. The Bible encourages us to be engaged in our government. So let me share with you. I'm going to share 10 scripture passages with you that I think, I mean, you may need more than that, but to me personally, these are the basic passages in the Bible that helps us to understand how we should deal with government, what our role should be in a government, and how we should participate in what is going on. Because if you don't participate, don't complain. I hear some uh, stupid things like, I don't want to vote for any, any of the presidents. Well, if you're not voting for any of the presidents, you voted for someone who won. Because you didn't have a voice, and because you didn't have a voice, the people who voted, voted your vote. Your vote is nil, but it helps somebody who won. So it's really important for us to look at this. If you can study these passages, which we're not going to have time to do here, but I want us to go through all the passages. If we can look at these passages, we're going to come up with what I believe will be seven principles that is to guide a Christian. Let me go through the principles real quick, and then we will go into the passages. Principle number one is that when you as a Christian want to be engaged in politics, make sure that you're following the Bible guidelines the Bible guidelines for us. And you should always be consistent how you follow the guidelines. Don't follow the guidelines when a Republican is in office and then you forget the guidelines when a Democrat is in office. Or you follow the principle when a Democrat is in office and you forget the principle when a Republican is in office. That is shameful. That is very, very shameful. I've, I've, I've seen some very, very, very influential evangelical leaders become hypocrites overnight. Let me give you an example. The Reverend Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, when Clinton was in office and Clinton was caught in some sexual impropriety with, I can't forget, Monica Lewinsky, uh, Reverend Graham came out and he ushered a statement that basically, I'm not quoting uh, verbatim, but basically what he said was, you know, uh, if Clinton can lie to his wife and his daughter, he can lie to the country. And therefore, it is important for us when we vote next time to put this in perspective. 
You cannot vote for a person who has lied to his wife and has lied to his daughter. And if he has done that, he's going to lie to the country. The same Reverend Bill, uh, uh, Franklin Graham came out when uh, Donald Trump was elected and a lot of things were being said about Donald Trump, especially uh, when the Hollywood uh, uh, tapes came out about what he said about grabbing women in, in their private parts and doing all this and kissing people and uh, molesting women. The same Reverend Billy Graham came out and said, this is between him and his family. It is nobody's business and we should leave him alone. You can go and fact check what I just told you. Go to Google and check it out. That's a shame. That's hypocrisy. The height of hypocrisy that you can change that quick and you will not say anything about a person who is obviously very racist and lies just about every day he has been in office. But then you were able to talk about someone that you said lied to his wife and his daughter. I don't want to look and seem like I'm taking sides here, but if you are a minister of the gospel, you answer to a higher authority. You don't answer to the Senate. You don't answer to Congress. You don't answer to Democrats. You don't answer to Republicans. You answer to God. And the last time I checked it, the Bible has not changed. Since the publication of the Bible, there has been nothing significant that has changed in the Bible. You may have it in different translations. It's still the same message. Same message. And the hypocrisy of all these so-called evangelical leaders in our country is coming out. We have to be sure we are following the biblical guidelines in what we say, what we teach, what we preach, and what we practice. Principle number two, love should always be the motivating factor of everything that a Christian does. Be motivated by love because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In fact, the Bible says we should love even people who hate us. The biblical love is the only love that can be commanded. I can command you to love. Where the, the errors, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Philadelphia, all the other type of love that we talk about, Stargate and everything, they are love that is motivated by how you feel, what is going on. The biblical love is love that you do not control by the way you feel. It's by what God says. Love one another. This is the, one of the great commandments Jesus gave to us. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So, if your politics makes you hate your brother, you're not practicing Christianity? I'm not saying don't call them out. Call them out. Challenge them. Have a very vibrant, lively debate. 
But don't hate your brother. Don't hate your sister. If you do, you probably didn't have the love of God to begin with. Love should guide the decisions that we make. Not only that, be consistent, no matter who oversees the country. Be very consistent. If it is Caesar, you should be consistent. If it is Alexander, you should be consistent. If it is Clinton, you should be consistent. If it is Jimmy Carter, you should be consistent. If it don't Ronald Reagan, you should be consistent. It should, it should be Donald Trump, you should be consistent. If it's Barack Obama, you should be consistent. Don't be like a chameleon. You only change to the color of your party, Republican or Democrat. Always be aware that God is the ultimate judge. God is the ultimate president. God is the ultimate governor. Always be aware of that. And don't be afraid of people who can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. Number five, always participate by voting. Amen. Vote. 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 It would be a shame if you're a Christian and you're not registered to vote and you're qualified to register to vote and you don't. It's a shame. There are so many of us that will complain and complain and complain and complain and complain. That's all we do. Go out and vote. Wear your mask. Take your sanitizer with you just in case the line is long. It's your responsibility. Have a say in your government. Also, when you read all these scripture passages, you need to always remember that nothing is permanent. Only God is. Nothing is permanent. Since I've been in this country and since I have been voting, I have voted when a Republican wins. I have voted when a Democrat wins, when a Democrat wins. And it changes. Put Democrats in there and they do their own shenanigans and people say, oh, is that the way you're going to do it? We're voting you out. You put Republicans in there and they do their own thing. And the people understand, oh, that's the way you want to go do it. We're going to vote you out. That is the difference between a constitutional republic and a dictatorship. Your vote is very powerful. Use it. Don't just talk about people. Don't just talk about the president. Don't just talk about the governor. Don't just talk about your senator. Don't just talk about your congressman. Vote. Vote to support them if they're doing well. Vote them out if they're not doing well. That's what it's all about. God holds us responsible to make sure that we do all we can to direct the country to where they are following as closely as possible to the Bible. And again, I'm telling you, I, I, you know, I know that the United States of America is not a Christian country. If you think it's a Christian country, you are, you are mightily, mightily deceived. The United States of America is not a Christian country. It is 
what you will call a republic. He does not use the Bible as his guide. He uses the Constitution. But we as Christians should hold Christian principles, biblical principles that guides the way we try to lead wherever we are. Whether you are a councilman, whether you are a, on the school board, whether you are on the, church, uh, on the council, whether you are uh, the governor of the state, whether you are in Congress, in the Senate, wherever you are, you ought to, you don't cease to be a Christian because you're a politician. And lastly, lastly, but not the least, pray always for what you cannot control. Pray because you know God is in control. Pray always. There are a lot of things we will not be able to control. There are a lot of things that are going to happen. Even some things that the person you voted for is going to do that you don't support. Pray. Pray that God's will be done. I'm going to uh, read those scriptures for you. I'm not going to comment on them, but I would like you to just write them down and go over them on your own. The first one is Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verses 1 through 7. In fact, I'm not going to read all the verses. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And then it goes on. 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And it says, Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake, or submit yourselves for the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorance talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. This is where there's a conflict between uh, the authority and the word of God. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. And now let's hear from Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. 
Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Now, let's go in the Old Testament, because you may think the Old Testament has nothing to say about government. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, there is a uh, passage I want to read. Uh, I want to read a lot in here, but I'm not going to read a lot. I'm just going to read verses 6 and 7. And I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you to read the whole of chapter 9. But let's look at verses 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verses 22 through 24. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshopper. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught, and he reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than, than he blows on them and they wither and the whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Let's look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. Proverbs chapter 14. Are you still with me? Or you're bored already? But anyway, let's look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse uh, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a disgrace to any people. Those are the principles of God. Last but not the least, Psalm 22. And I'm going to read verse 28. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. What is it? The principle of the Bible is God first. God first. In any government, always obey God first. Obey the government. Treat your fellow citizens with respect, honor, and love. And whatever you do, vote, vote, vote. God bless you.